I'm guessing that if you've clicked on this video, which obviously you have, you probably heard of Prop Hunt as a game mode. It's been around for the better part of 15 years or so, originally gaining popularity during the early days of the popular community-driven open source game Gary's Mod, developed on the original Source 1 engine. Shortly thereafter, the mode spread to TF2, Team Fortress 2, another very prominent Source 1 game, due to how easy it was to basically reuse the same code for the same engine, and since then many other third-party developers and even AAA studios have embraced the mode in their respective games, with even Call of Duty itself, arguably one of the biggest AAA cash cows in the industry, getting in on the action. But despite that fact, we haven't seen a lot of prop hunt only games, and the few indie developers that have done so never really made any effort to introduce any new mechanics, rework any concepts, or in any other way really do much to establish their own spin on prop hunt as it stands now. Which is one reason why I had marginally low expectations for this particular game. Prop hunt is being developed by a relatively untested and unheard of team by the name of Fantastic, and I'm presuming that's how you pronounce it because it's kind of an unusual name for a developer. And it's being published by an equally inexperienced publisher referred to as Maitana. Since the only two games either Fantastic or Maitana have been currently attached to are Prop Night itself and the upcoming co-op zombie survival game The Day Before, which itself has gotten a lot of flack from its fanbase and content creators due to their very poor planned PR strategies and overall lack of communication. This ties into Prop Hunt only so far as Fantastic and Maitana very bizarrely chose to announce Prop Night right in the middle of a live stream event that was specifically supposed to be about the day before, but which was cut short to show off this game instead. Look, I'm not a developer, I'll readily admit that, but for the better part of a year I worked as the junior member of the PR team of a small company, which doesn't make me an expert at all, but it does give me a bit of insight into how this process works. Writing up PR releases, working on promotional videos, that kind of thing was my field, the digital side of things. Even with my relatively short time in the field, I can tell you flat out that hijacking your main event that's supposed to be about one specific product by instead pivoting to an unrelated product, one that doesn't directly correlate with what your audience has come to expect. It's not exactly a great winning strategy. And I know some people might say these guys are developers, they're not PR people, so get a PR person. Figure this stuff out to avoid future PR disasters. Because right now, both companies seem to be actively seeking out these PR potholes every opportunity they get. But while the announcement might have been only slightly short of a disaster, at least in terms of timing, it did come with one particular upside. As soon as the trailer went live during the live stream, the developers concurrently released a weekend-long open beta on Steam, allowing anyone who was interested to request access to the beta via the game's new Steam story page. So I say to myself, what the hell, and over the course of two days, I jump in and play. And I'm not gonna lie, it's not that bad. In fact, honestly, I had a pretty good time, which really surprised me. So let me start off with one of the first things you'll probably have noticed already. The art style is really cartoony and gives off a bit of a Hello Neighbor or Fortnite vibe. I know I myself was definitely often being reminded of Secret Neighbor in particular. It's alright at best, I wasn't very impressed with how they went about designing the character models. All of them look very generic and forgettable, although the animations do have a bit of flair to them, which does help offset the lackluster character models themselves a little bit. Now the gameplay itself will likely prove to be very familiar to those of you that have played Dead by Daylight before. While most asymmetrical multiplayer games all follow similarly contrived gameplay formulas, Prop Night here goes out of its way to clearly identify itself as an almost one-for-one -one copy-paste of Dead by Daylight. And when I say that, I genuinely do mean that. Whether you love this game, hate it, or are indifferent to it altogether, you have to admit that if you remove the Prop Hunt element from the equation, you're literally just playing Dead by Daylight in a more colorful but less memorable map but we'll get to the maps in a minute. Currently in the game, there are about half a dozen playable survivors, and I believe four playable monsters. Personally, I played mostly as the monster, but I did also put in a few matches as the survivor to get a well-rounded opinion. Let's talk about survivors first, shall we? Once the match starts, the players on the survivor team have a clear set of objectives. Repair a number of power generators scattered across the medium-sized map, while the monster attempts to hunt down the survivors one by one and attack them until they get knocked down, at which point the monster will pick up the survivors one by one and bring them to one of the multiple restraint chairs located around the map, at which point the player in question is completely incapacitated, requiring one or more of the other survivors to go rescue them within the following two minutes or so. 
effectively creating a centralized, one-sided metagame of Capture the Flag. If the other players manage somehow to rescue said player, the player is freed, but if they're later recaptured by the monster, the rescue time window drops to about a minute. And if the player is captured a third time, they're immediately killed on the spot and forced to remain a spectator for the rest of the match. The problem is, spectators are in some ways even more useful than an actual living player, as they still retain full access to both voice chat and text chat, and can quickly alternate between different spectating cameras, allowing them to essentially guide their living teammates, providing the survivors an additional advantage. Personally, I don't think this is good for the long-term future of the game as it creates serious balancing issues. The biggest advantage of the monster, the killer, if however you prefer to identify them, is their ability to pop out at you out of nowhere and completely throw a wrench into your plans. If spectators can just openly tell you at any given point where the monster is, who they're disguised at, where they are even when they're invisible, etc., it all effectively handicaps the monster in every possible way. Also, it doesn't help that some maps are very open and brightly lit, like the farm level you'll see a lot of in this gameplay, since it was one of only two maps featured in this playtest, making it all but impossible for the killer to disappear out of sight for even a brief span of time. As this is a beta and not the full game, the amount of content on display here does not in any way match what the full game will likely hold when it releases next month on November 30th. And I don't really expect a beta to contain all the good stuff anyway. That said, based on what is here, I do have other concerns. The player base itself is very hit or miss. I've had several great matches with other goofy, fun-loving players who enjoy just messing around and getting the objectives done, and I've played with other players who just want to keep things straight and only do what the objective says with no deviation, and that's fine too. But I've also had several other matches where the other players on my team were hella toxic, and I don't throw that term around lightly. I wasn't really all that bothered personally because I've been on the internet long enough where you'd have to try pretty damn hard to really get under my skin, but it definitely would have been nice if I had more tools at my disposal to adapt to situations like this. Personally, I think the game would have greatly benefited from introducing a community-like reputation system similar to games like Overwatch where the more well-behaved players can have clean, fun games, whereas the more toxic players get thrown into matches alongside other equally toxic players. Why not? Just go full Canis Canum with it. Another addition I would prefer to see by the time the game launches next month, as I think it would be far easier to configure in the weeks between now and then, is to allow players to be freely able to mute other players, as well as be able to enable or disable the text chat at will. As both a content creator and player, there are times when I don't necessarily always want to see what people are saying, if you understand what I mean. This is the internet after all. Finally, as far as communication improvements go, I do think this game would greatly benefit from reworking the current voice chat system from a global one to a more proximity-based system. In a game all about stealth and communication, it makes no sense for the killer to be able to overhear the survivor's whispered voice chat conversation from the opposite side of the map. Also, going for the proximity voice chat approach would greatly change up the gameplay dynamic for survivors as well. Do you stay banded together within range of voice chat and move around the map more slowly in a pack, or do you risk splintering off individually, or in duos, and risk running out of earshot of the other players? As far as technical performance goes, the game seems to be very well optimized. I observed no noticeable frame drop or screen tearing, nor any other noteworthy issue so far as other visuals were concerned. However, I did experience a number of server crashes, probably three or four times in total, out of the dozen or so matches I played. And based on the reports I've read from other players on forums and social media, it seems my experience overall is certainly comparable to most others, with other players experiencing similar if not worse. These kinds of server and technical failures are not uncommon for a beta, so I'm by no means trying to hold the developers' feet to the fire here. It's certainly cause for concern if they don't address this in some capacity by the time the game releases next month, but I don't see that being the case, as this is very easily fixed with capable hands. As far as general improvements go, there are still a few items left on my list in no particular order. For one, there's a lot of balancing issues worth observing. For one, it is way too easy for survivors disguised as small props to hide under furniture or other large static objects, making them effectively invincible as it makes it impossible for the killer to get a hold of them or directly harm them in any way. He's coming back for you guys. Run. I think he's the toolbox.
setting aside any possible AoE damage cooldown abilities the killer may have access to. Another minor critique is that the QTE that plays out as you're repairing the generators is way too generous once you get the hang of it. I definitely feel it could have been a bit more punishing, with the window of success maybe narrowing every time you successfully complete one hurdle. Currently, the game gives survivors way too much leeway in this area. Speaking of areas where survivors have a bit too much leeway, let's talk about character abilities. Both teams, the survivor and the killer, each have unique individual character ability kits, each designed around a certain particular playstyle. You've got a survivor who's basically a medic and can heal other players, you've got another survivor who builds barricades that can block doorways and slow the killer down by preventing them from entering the room until they first destroy the barricade, etc. But on the flip side, the killer also has their own abilities and playstyle. I personally spent most of my time playing as the nun, so I can't speak too much about how balanced or lack thereof the other killers were, as I only played one or two rounds as the others, since the nun honestly fit my playstyle, which is far more aggressive. And I can tell you up front, the nun is not balanced, not even remotely. And I know I'm not the only person, I'm far from the only player in the game's community to feel that way. That said, I honestly can't say I mind in the short term, as it's been really fun to exploit how overpowered that character is for my own gain during the beta. I know it's selfish to say it, but I'm being totally honest here. It is fun to play a character so utterly broken. While we're still on the topic of the survivor characters, I do want to make note of another smaller complaint that I don't foresee will be likely reworked in time for launch, but I'm going to mention it regardless. There's not really much of an incentive to stick around in the match if you've found yourself eliminated and left in spectator mode. I've now often found myself in this position, as while I've gotten knocked down and captured plenty of times, I think I've only ever got eliminated maybe once or twice in total. That said, in a few instances, the experience was almost unbearably boring. I think in an unrealistic dream scenario, it'd be pretty cool if eliminated players could freely move around their camera and be able to see through walls and have a proper spectator's HUD, showing them the current completion status of the objectives. Which generators are turned on, which haven't been touched at all, which are in various stages of middling completion, etc. As well as color-coded character outlines showing the current positioning of all living survivors and the killer, including unique color-coded outlines for imprisoned survivors. Because currently as a survivor, you spend your entire afterlife looking at essentially nothing whatsoever. And to me, that doesn't feel remotely fun or arguably fair to that player to ask them to spend minutes at a time staring at nothing and doing nothing. So either create a spectator HUD that actually somewhat resembles a functional spectator HUD, or at least bare minimum, when the developers inevitably create a battle pass and probably some kind of player reporting system post-launch. Don't penalize players for leaving a match if they're only a spectator. Even Fortnite has implemented that small compromise measure. Another survivor-related change I would make is to reduce the volume of footsteps on certain floor surfaces, like in the Manor House map. As a killer character, I shouldn't be able to constantly pinpoint the survivor's location from an entire floor away. I would often be on the second floor roaming around and still be able to hear the survivors moving around in a distant first floor location like the kitchen. Or vice versa, be in one of the first floor hallways and hear survivors moving around in one of the upper rooms. The range at which you can hear nearby survivor footsteps needs to be significantly reduced, by I would say at least around 20-25% to compared to what we have now. But on the flip side, I do think it's not just the killers that need a nerf. The jump height of players disguised as props is ridiculous. It makes it all but impossible for killers to counter them while they're airborne, leading to a number of matches where all the players would have to do is just bounce around in order to escape the killer's grasp. I still think this should be a feature, but I feel the maximum height of these jumps needs to be significantly reduced, or alternatively you create more AoE-focused cooldown abilities for future killers in order to combat this. But I don't think that would feel good from a gameplay perspective. So let's say maybe a 25 or 30% maximum reduced jump height to eliminate that low gravity component and maybe slightly increase the speed of the jump, making it more of an escape tactic rather than purely a troll technique. Again, this is just how I would try balancing it in future playtests. The aforementioned proposed numeral percentages don't matter so much to me as generally illustrating the need for some kind of rework. Moving on, there's been some contentious deliberation within the game's community about what price the game should be listed at, and whether the developers should even charge anything for it at all. I've seen arguments ranging to both extremes, where some players have advocated for a $50 or $60 price tag, and others have demanded it should be free and without monetization. Most players have seemed to accept one of two moderate 
positions. Either a flat $20 or $30 price tag with additional DLC down the road, or a free-to-play live service model with cosmetic DLC in addition to Survivor and Killer DLC packs, and maybe a battle pass on top of that. Personally, I'm more or less fine with either option. If I had to pick between the two though, I'd lean more in favor of a low $15 to $20 price tag with maybe a seasonal battle pass option. Of all the live service monetization gimmicks, I'm generally most receptive to battle passes or item shops, presuming they just offer cosmetics, and not anything that offers an inherent pay-to-win advantage over the opposing team for those that unlock it. In the coming weeks, I do expect to see more open communication from the developers in terms of better detailing what changes we can expect to see between this beta and the game's launch, as well as new screenshots and video footage of some of the other currently unknown maps that we can expect to ultimately play at launch. And in general, I think the developers could do a somewhat better job of communicating to the more casual player base their intentions moving forward. Posting updates regularly in their own Discord page is one thing, but the problem is that only your diehard fans are really going to join your game's Discord group in the first place, with even fewer going on to become consistent, active participants. And while I don't believe developers should only have to cater to one side or the other, I do think it's more than reasonable to accept the singular universal truth that it's of far more importance to try to reach out to newcomers and the rest of the silent majority, rather than continuing to preach ad nauseum to the choir. You have to give this larger, more silent group their due as well. Otherwise, the game in question will ultimately find only limited short-term success at launch and be plagued with long queue times as simply having the Discord community on your side alone won't be enough to sustain a healthy-sized online multiplayer community. Overall, I'm definitely interested to see where this game is headed moving forward. I think if they fix the above areas I mentioned and make the recommended changes or something very similar, the game has great odds of retaining a decently sustainable player base for the foreseeable future. And on that note, that's where I think I'm going to wrap it up for today. As ever, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to click the like button, and comment below what you think of the game. Comments really, really help my videos get boosted in the algorithm. And plus, I read and respond to nearly all the comments I get, so even if you just want to drop a comment just to say hi or get my opinion on something, even if it's unrelated, I'll be more than happy to talk with you there. Likewise, subscribing and clicking the bell really helps. I know it's cliche, believe me, I know, but the YouTube algorithm is a pain in the ass to deal with, so doubly so as a small channel. This is Warrior Dan signing out. Stay awesome, everybody. Stay safe and peace out.